Hi everyone, and welcome to this episode of Learn Life TV. Hi Igor, how are you? Hey Barbara, good, good to see you. All right, well, this is the final episode of this uh, bicep series that we've been doing. So uh, this is the final one. Hope everyone has followed along with everything we've done so far and uh, that you're ready for this episode where we're going to talk about how you can control and govern your Azure environment by deploying your infrastructure as code. So um, first, let us introduce ourselves real quickly. My name is Barbara Forbes. I am the Azure Technical Lead at OGD in the Netherlands, and I am a Microsoft MVP for Azure. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Igor Jovovich, and I am a cloud solution architect working for Microsoft in New Zealand, uh, and I'm part of the Azure Core team here. Thanks, Barbara. All right, and we're not alone here today. We're the ones on camera, but there are more people involved. And you can say hi to our moderator, Joshua, who is joining us as well. And he will be answering everything in the chat. So if you want to uh, talk with us, if you want to ask any questions, leave them in the chat. So uh, this is a module that you can find on Microsoft Learn and uh, you can follow along. I would recommend to do this afterwards because uh, it's gonna be kind of hard to focus on both us and following the module, uh, but you can see the link on the screen, the aka.ms link. Uh, this leads you straight to the Microsoft Learn module and you can watch us walk through it and do it later, um, or you can follow along yourself uh, at a later time. So as I said, this is uh, we are live here, so you can talk to us, you can chat with us. Uh, all the links will be posted in the chat, so you can follow along there as well. So don't hesitate to say hi, and if you have any questions about the stuff we're talking about, don't hesitate to ask them in the chat, and we'll be happy to answer them. That's right. So what we're doing today, we have some objective of the goals that we want to reach. Uh, we want to plan an Azure deployment strategy for multiple environments. So we're gonna talk a little bit about not only having one environment like production, but also how you work with development and staging and maybe more. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how you can harden and help secure Azure DevOps and GitHub and the deployment pipeline. We're gonna talk about all the different elements this hours and we'll talk about hardening and help secure your azure environment so to make sure that everything that you're planning is controlled and everything is done in a secure way finally we'll talk a little bit about how you can enable manual access if there is some kind of emergency So with these plans out of the way, let's talk a little bit about um, some scenarios that you might come across um, that you want to consider. So when you run an Azure environment and you have a big team that is working with it, there are some scenarios that can happen that you might not want to happen. Uh, so if you want to have full control of an environment and you're deploying everything to infrastructure as code, um, let's look at all these team members here doing stuff that we might not want them to do. So in the first person here we see at the little one is someone who's making a direct change in the Azure portal. And that's something if we have infrastructure as code, we might not want because if we push infrastructure as code afterwards, it might overwrite that change. or maybe we don't know about this change. We create a new environment and that change is not part of it. So that's something that we might not want. We want something more controlled than that. So then we have the second scenario, which is a little better, which is someone who is pushing a bicep file. So they are using infrastructure as code, but they're doing it from their local machine. So again, we have no auditing of what's going on. We have no testing here. We have no reviews going on. So that's also a scenario which might not make us too happy. It's better than scenario one, but it's not the best. So then we have scenario three where we have a service principle. So the deployment is done through a service principle, but in this case, someone has copied 
the credentials from the service principle and use them from their local machine to do the deployment. And now our credentials are somewhere and we don't know where they are, we can't keep track of them. So that's also something that we might want to avoid. Uh, now moving on to scenario four, where, okay, we are now working in Azure DevOps or GitHub. So that's good. And we might be working to pipelines, but do we have an approval in here? Or is this someone who can just change the main branch when they want to, and then it will be deployed? So what if there's a mistake in there somewhere that will also be deployed to Azure? So again, we're getting better and better, but it's not ideal. Very close. And I think Igor, you have also you've seen this kind of scenarios. Uh, if you're like me, have you also seen that some teams grow where they go from scenario one, two, three up until five? Oh, most definitely. Yeah. So I think you know when everyone starts of Azure, scenario one or uh, well, person one is, is quite common. But as you mature, you kind of work your way down, and that's definitely what I've seen um, as well. Yeah, and that's the, the difficult thing is that uh, scenario one, especially if you're a single administrator or if you're just starting out, then it's probably what you're doing. And maybe you have a team where you have everything set up and a new member comes by and he's still used to doing everything in the portal, he or she. So he's used to doing it like that. And you want to prevent that. You want to make sure that it doesn't happen. Even if someone has no ill will, you don't want this stuff to happen. So what we are striving for to, is to block all every all other scenarios. So no accidents can happen. And everything is deployed to scenario five, where it's true uh, Azure DevOps or GitHub. It's true a pipeline or GitHub actions. It's true a service principle. And it's all reviewed and tested. Awesome. And by the time you go through the learn module, you should be at scenario or person number five as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So just to get it straight again, so we know what we're doing, we're gonna learn how you can enforce your deployments, not only as infrastructure as code, but in a secure way and in a controlled way. And by the end of this model, module, you'll be able to identify what controls you have, what governance you have available, and you can apply them to your Azure environment, your repositories, and your pipeline. So everything is deployed through infrastructure as code in a safe and controlled way. So that's the goal we're trying to reach today. Awesome. Thanks for that, Barbara. So the first unit that we'll go over is the plan your environments, right? So you might have heard a quote out uh, out in the world, and it's and it's along the lines of you you fail to plan means you plan to fail, right? So that also applies to our Azure environment, right? So planning your environment is definitely important for you to succeed. In this unit. What we'll learn about is you consistently using our infrastructure as code deployments and configuration. We'll look at the level of automation of each environment. Uh, we can look at some of the checks and gates, you know, which environment is controlled, which environment would want to keep as uncontrolled. And we'll also look at the type of governance and controls as well. So we might have some manual approvals. We might have some governance uh, in Azure DevOps or GitHub. We've got some governance as well in the Azure portal. Um, and we'll be looking, looking through all of that today. So when we talk about infrastructure as code, right, a lot of the common resources that we refer to are things like maybe app services, virtual machines, you know, storage accounts, right? But you can actually do a lot more with that. You can go look at some of the resource organization resources, right? So things like subscriptions, management group, resource group, this can all be provisioned through infrastructure as code and using your, your BICEP templates. We have Azure policy, right? So Azure policy helps with policy-driven governance. It helps with any kind of configuration drift. Essentially, what you can do is assign policy to these resources there on the left, and that way you can enforce your organizational standards and also check compliance easily through the portal in a single blade. What you can also do with BICEP is assign role-based access control or RBAC assignments, right? And you can assign these to groups, service principles, individual users. This can all be done in a BICEP template which can live in your repository. 
One of the other things you can do is configure alerts. So part of Azure Monitor, we have amazing alerts and alert rules. You can also deploy these through your, through your BICEP template. And that way you can have consistency, you can have tested alerts from one environment to the next, and also go through a peer review process to make sure that your alerts align to the standards of your organization. It's pretty cool stuff. Do you remember when you found out that you were able to do a lot more than just resources? <laughs> well, yeah, I know before I could only do resource groups and then being able to provision yeah. subscriptions uh, through BICEP has, has been amazing, right? So I can easily provision subscriptions when I need ephemeral environments, when I want to you know, go through the process. I don't have to find what's the billing ID, which user it is. I can just go through the automation that I've invested in and, and set up. It's, it's great. So handy. Yeah. Cool. So it is helpful to list out the environments that you plan to use, right? And I, and I just want to say these aren't all the environments. You know, they're the maybe your customers, your organization has more. Uh, what we're looking here is obviously just just a guide. But the whole idea is is that you want to have different environments for for different purposes, right? So. Some of these environments, uh, the one in the green, obviously, arguably the most important one. So that has your production code, that will have your production configuration, but then the environments to the left there, like development, test, and staging, uh, you want to plan, you want to consider having those, invest time into planning, but also those environments might not have production code, right? So there might be code that you know you're still working on, new features, fixing bugs, but it is it is important to plan them out and also document them. So that way your team, um, you know, everyone kind of knows what you're doing. So some of these environments might be long live, right? So other environments might be what we call ephemeral. So you only might create some of these environments such as the PR reviews and the sandboxes for, for a certain amount of time, right? So however you want to do it, um, the idea is, is that you, you need to plan it out and obviously have have different environments for different purposes, which is what we'll go through as part of this unit. So we can look at, um, you know, why why it's good to have multiple environments. You know, talking about isolation, um, and and then all that. One of the key aspects is controlled environments, right? So this is just an example as well. But what we can see here is we have different environments with different control levels, right? And by control levels, what that might mean is a formal process to deploy into them, right? Where some might be uncontrolled, right? So as you can see here, we have a development environment and what that development environment refers to in this instance is integrating multiple changes from, from different developers into a single environment, right? So the idea here is we need to have it controlled, right? Because if, if one developer is doing something in the dev environment, we want to make sure that they're aware if there's other changes that are going to be introduced there, right? In contrast, there is a sandbox environment, right? And what the sandbox environment is, it's ideally to create, develop, development team members can create that. And this is where they might experiment with some of the newer services or newer resources that might not have gone through the same approval process or control process to be able to go into those higher environments, such as development, maybe a test environment or, or production. We have a performance testing environment there as well so the whole idea is you know as we kind of saw in the previous slide that that's short-lived right so with the performance testing environment uh what we do there is dynamically create it right so maybe based on some sort of cadence so if you're doing performance testing maybe on a schedule maybe maybe after a certain feature is released um you know we want to make sure we can do as much testing in our in our devops um uh, practice or in our devops pipeline and the whole idea with the performance testing environment is we can dynamically create it and that way we can stress test it without affecting uh, our production environment, right? So this will be you know, close to production, um, but, but obviously uh, not production. So what we can also do is once we've agreed upon how we want these environments, uh, what, how we want the structure of environments to, to be set up, you can actually use some of the features in the portal uh, or even tag them as part of your provisioning process if you're using BICEP to provision a subscription, which you should, you can actually tag them, right? So as you can see in the little clip at the bottom there, we have our subscription, and what we're doing is we're tagging with certain meta, uh, metadata values, right? So it's just using the, the same values as we can see in the table above, 
But when it's in the portal or when it's in your Azure environment, you can use things such as resource graph to query it. You can use different policies based on tag. Um, you know, if someone does go in and you know wants to do a bit of a stock take as to you know the operations team, how much subscriptions do they have? How many long lived subscriptions are around? You know, what's the control level? That's a possibility, right? And and tags are a great resource for that. Tags are so underrated. They're awesome. Oh, I, I, I love them. It, it's, there's so much you can do with them nowadays. And really, you should use it like, uh, besides all automation, this tells someone who's new to the environment can now find out information about these resources directly in the source. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And there's even more and more features that are being integrated into tags. So there was updates. You can do cost for tagging. Um, and yeah, you're right. You know, if you do have a new person come in, you can obviously use more than just these three tags here, um, but it can really give you a lot of information about the subscription or any particular resource that, that you're referring to. So one of the key concepts as well about, so we talked about, you know, planning your environment, right? So you want to kind of know, okay, which environment is for which purpose, but but what does it actually mean, right? So what 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 is an environment? So what we... Uh, what, what, what we're seeing here is leveraging subscriptions, right? So leveraging subscriptions for an environment is is, is a very common practice to do, right? And, and it, it actually works great. So you can see here, we've got four different subscriptions and in those we've got a development subscription, a test and a pre-production, right? So it is important to separate each environment and where possible make them self-contained, right? So a subscription is a great resource for you to use. But what you need to do is you do need to be careful, right? Because a lot of services uh, such as Avena and Akiva in this instance do allow you to actually connect between one resource and one subscription to another in another subscription, right? So you do want to make sure that you use uh, good governance, right? Which is what we'll discuss later on to make sure that the resources in these subscriptions are isolated, right? So you want to make sure that, you know, for an example, you don't pair a production virtual network to a development virtual network, right? Barbara, do you have any stories of, of isolation that, that you've seen? This this happens so often <laughs> where you see that there's a development environment and I often have quite, uh, customers who say, hey, it's development, so we don't want all those policies on there and don't want all the security measures because the, our developers need their freedom. And then I say, okay, so this has no connection to any production data whatsoever, right? And it almost always does. So I've oh, seen man. development for the environments that use production data, which actually is a big no-no. And they knew it was a big no-no. I see that a lot. Yeah, we know we shouldn't do this, but we don't have an alternative. And they have all these great excuses. Uh, I have also seen development uh, being connected through the network with production with no limits because yeah, they need some sort of application that's still on-prem to make a connection to. And I always say, if it's touching production, then it's production. So you should cheat, treat it as production. I totally and, agree with that yeah, one. That's the great thing about sandboxes. So I say, okay, if you really want all the freedom you can get, use a sandbox, but you're not gonna get a connection to anything. Nice. And that, that then it's what we saw in the table previously, right? So Sandbox does have that ability for uh, experimentation, but you know, as, as we can kind of see here, we do want to ensure that we have good governance uh, across our environments to uh, avoid that, um, you know, that kind of cross contamination, if you will, right? Because what we don't want to do is, you know, leak sensitive production data in a development environment, which might not be as secure, right? So you want to make sure that we have good security across everything that will have any any uh, interaction with any production data. So good to see. Absolutely. Awesome. So one of the other things we want to plan are checks and gates, right? So when we refer to a gate, what that is, is an automated uh, or manual, right? It doesn't have to be automated, but an automated or a manual check that must succeed for a deployment to continue, right? So we might not have the same gates everywhere, but the whole idea is part of our deployment process, we want to have certain checks and gates, right? So some of the checks that we can see here, code reviews, right? So one of the awesome concepts that Barbara is going to talk about shortly are code reviews, right? So those are, you know, having having four eyes, if you will, over different uh, bicep changes uh, is, is great. We've got linting. So this is more like static code analysis, right? So you can integrate all of these into your Azure DevOps or GitHub uh, pipeline, right? 
So what you also might do is these are not exclusive, right? So you might run some or multiple checks as part of these uh, as part of these uh, this deployment process, especially in controlled environments, right? So maybe in uncontrolled, you only have a few, maybe more on the manual side, but in a controlled environment, you can totally combine a lot of these concepts, right? Such as the automated smoke testing, you know, any sort of manual approval, right? So deploying to production, you probably want to have, have some manual approval there just to make sure it automatically that doesn't go in. But these are just some examples. There's obviously more that you can do, um, but it's, it's definitely important as part of your deployment. And especially as you, you know, as you want to increase your confidence, right? You want to try and get away from doing, uh, you know, bulk of it being manual to more of it being automated and using some of the abilities that, that BICEP gives you. But always, you know, uh, there will be manual intervention there, right? So manual intervention for any sort of approval gates for your deployment, right? So we do have some recommended practices here, right? So the first one there is being clearly define who's allowed to approve your deployment, right? So one of the things you want to do here is, you know, you want to back it by Azure AD, right? So integrating, you know, your GitHub instance or your Azure DevOps instance into Azure Active Directory. And that way you can define a group, right? So you don't want to have a single person, right? So in case something happens to that person, but you do want to have a group to be able to do a some sort of manual approval, right? And then you can also easily in the future change those around, right? So if people leave your organization, you know, people change teams. So, you know, you can use different groups to approve different uh, environments, different uh, applications. If you're a company that has multiple workloads, right? You might want to have different groups, but the whole idea is, is that you want to be able to clearly define who's able to do that, right? And what's what's better to use in a group, really? One of the, one of the other recommended practices is having a process for emergency deployment, right? So as we kind of talked about, plan, 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 right? So one of the things you want to plan is your environment, but as part of that, you want to plan who is able to approve a deployment if your normal approvers aren't available, right? So this is talking more about an emergency deployment, right? Which might happen during a vacation period, right? It might happen also during some sort of uh, after hours component where maybe the usual people who would approve it, you know, are, are sleeping and it's the poor on-call person who has to do this emergency change, right? So you really want to do and consider having a process for those emergency deployments. And what we'll talk about later in this module is having a uh, a break glass account for an emergency uh, process as well, which, which we'll kind of build on um, shortly. One of the other practices that we do see succeed is limiting human intervention to just approving and rejecting a deployment, right? So as we kind of saw in, in Barbara's scenario earlier, right, we do want to limit human interaction through the portal, through BICEP deployments, right? You want to make sure it is uh, it goes through your deployment process uh, in scenario number five, if you remember earlier. So that way, you know, you kind of get their reviews. Um, you're able to use a service principle for deployment. You don't have to kind of share any passwords. So the whole idea is, is that you don't want to uh, have a human right, to run any of your deployments unless it's a step that you can't automate, right? So as you kind of mature in that space, um, you know, there might be uh, more human uh, touches than, than you'd like, but as you kind of move on and get mature, this should be really limited to maybe just approving a certain deployment or a emergency process. Cool. So we do in Azure have good governance capabilities, right? And what I'll do is I'll actually show you some of these in the portal, right? So if we kind of jump straight through here, one of the key governance uh, resources that we talk about are management groups, right? And management groups are great. So as you can see here, I've got some management groups listed. So I have a what's called an intermediate route called TF, which is this one here. And then I've got a few other management groups called decommissioned, landing zones, platform and sandboxes, right? And if you're asking, oh, this looks familiar, well, it does. So this is actually based on our Azure Landing Zone project, which we can link uh, in the show notes, right? So this project that allows you to kind of quickly set up your Azure estate and your scaffolding, um, and it is also available in, in BICEP, which is, which is great, right? So you can take some of the skills that you've learned as part of this module and, and, and during the series and actually apply it with maybe um, you know one of your first deployments if, if, if you're new, or even if you want to align to it, right? So with the management group, you can see here, I can just quickly open this up. And this is for my landing zone. So this is where I'd actually deploy my workloads. 
And a management group can sit under multiple levels, which we won't get into now, but the whole idea is, is that you can apply role-based access control to a management group, right? So what that means is you apply role-based access control to a management group, and then any subscriptions sitting under that management group, which I kind of have, which I just have one now, will get those permissions, right? So it, it's great from a governance perspective. But also what it allows you to do is place your subscriptions underneath these groups. So then you can easily identify what you need, uh, you know, kind of where they belong, what their purpose is, um, and also from a role-based access perspective, you, you can easily apply um, your, your access control for it to trickle down. All right, so we can see some management groups here. Um, one of the key benefits of management groups and one of the key services that we see uh, from, um, from a governance perspective is policy, right? So if I just move to the left here, you'll see policy, and I can go into policy and straight away, I can see my compliance state, right? So this is just a demo environment, so I don't have too much here, but I've got a few different policies. Um, and one of them is to do with monitoring. I've got different ones for security. So, you know, based on what your organization uh, needs, you can you can define policy for that, right? So some policies for blocking or allowing certain locations, um, but a lot of these policies here, you can assign to different management groups to have good governance. Uh, down the stream. Barbara, what are some of the policies that you've used that, that you've enjoyed? Oh, there's so many policies out there. There's so many options that we can use. And I think the one that uh, most uh, companies worldwide is one of the easiest to implement that you don't even have to think about is um, the deployment location. So to yes. set up specific regions uh, where you want to deploy your resources. And I know um, you want your resources close to you um, to make sure the latency okay. isn't that good, if isn't that bad. So, um, But what we see in Europe a lot is that they want them in European uh, regions uh, because of the laws uh, and the governance that's part of it. So that's one I see a lot that's been used. Nice. And I see that on my side of the world as well. And there's there's different ones you can apply. And also, if you wanted to, you can create your own. So policy, great for governance. And to check that everything you've done in your deployment process and your pipeline, your templates, adhere to the standards that you have, right? Another key governance feature is locks, right? So as you can see, locks, there, there are different types of locks that you can do. So I just have a storage account here. And if I you know try to do something like delete it, so if I just put in the name here, I can apply a certain lock for me to, let me just get that. I can apply a certain lock for me to stop certain uh, commands, right? So as you can see here, I maybe accidentally wanted to delete the storage account, but what I can do is apply a lock. So I can see I've got a nice error, which you know in this instance, we do wanna have, uh, I, I was expecting this error and you might ask why. And the reason is if I open up that storage account now, I can check something called a lock, right? So just under here locks, and you can also apply these through through Bicep, right? which is which is awesome. So I've got a lock here called no delete, lock type is delete, and I, I've scoped it to my storage account here. And there are different scopes you can use, but the whole idea is here, imagine if you have, you know, a, you know, you're working in multiple environments, maybe you have multiple tabs like me, maybe you have multiple browsers, and what you thought you did is delete a storage account in your sandbox environment, but you know you were you were logged into another controlled environment, right? So obviously you want to make sure you do it through a pipeline, but you know this is just another kind of governance resource, right? That helps you stop uh, accidental deletion, right? So that's that's awesome. And one of the other components that we talked about earlier today is monitor, right? So through monitor. This is, a, this is a, a suite of a bunch of different resources, but from an alerts perspective, right? Creating those alerts. So we can kind of see here, luckily I have no, no fired alerts in the past 24 hours, but what I could do is using my bicep template, I could quite easily create some of these alert rules that you can kind of see me do through the portal, right? And the reason you might think it's, you know, why, why are you creating alerts through, through bicep? All the benefits that apply to typical bicep templates, I can apply to my bicep alert templates, right? So having that good consistent deployment process, being able to have integrity to know that what I deploy and test 
that's what I'm going to deploy in production as well. Cool. So we looked at policy, we looked at locks, management groups, and monitor. So these aren't the only ones, but there are a lot more resources that can help. Um, these are just some of the ones we've discussed today and that you can deploy with your BICEP templates. Awesome. So what we'll talk about Hi. next is securing the repositories and pipelines. So over to you, Barbara. Yeah, so we've seen a little bit about what we can do in our Azure environment. And now let's consider what we can do in uh, either GitHub or Azure DevOps. So we'll walk through both of them pretty much through uh, this chapter. And it's good to know, I'll do the disclaimer right now that we're gonna talk about pipelines a lot. And when we talk about pipelines, we also mean GitHub Actions. Um, because uh, yeah, there we call the workflow, but uh, just assume we're always talking about both of them to keep it easy for us. So what do we need to protect and why? Why should we care about that? Well, let's walk through this real quickly where we can consider we need to protect our Azure DevOps organization or our GitHub repository. So why do we care? Well, uh, there could be uh, someone with evil intentions or maybe even an ex-employee who uh, has some sort of beef uh, that will delete our code. And you can do that pretty drastically in both Azure DevOps and GitHub. So that's something you want to avoid. Um, then underneath that, we want to uh, protect the branches in our repository, and especially the main branch, so the most important branches that we use. So we want to do that in case someone um, adds some non-secure code or even wrong code to our main branch. So the main branch should always be like, this is production. And you might even have some automatic deployment from the main branch. So you want to protect that to make sure there's no mistakes in that code. Which brings us to the code inside the repository. So we also want to make sure there's no wrong code, no unsecure code, no code that is not actually working or even code that's not up to best practices. So we want to keep everything as clean as we can. And below that, we have the pipeline definition itself. So what could happen in the pipeline definition? Um, someone could add a step that proposes some sort of security risk. So maybe someone uh, thinks, yeah, we'll create some logging in here and they write a connection string to the logs. And now that connection string is breached. So that's something you also want to avoid. Uh, then we need to protect the agents and the runners that are running our pipelines, the agents in Azure DevOps, the runners in, in GitHub Actions. They're pretty much the same thing. Uh, these are machines that will run our pipelines, and we also need to take care of those machines because if something malicious is installed on that machine, it might get access to our code, to our credentials, and to our environment. So we got that, and then we have to take care of our tasks as well. So every task, every component we use within our pipeline um, could also be malicious, especially if it's something community driven, then someone can create a task and put something malicious in there that will collect the credentials or collect connection strings or something like that and write it off to their own database. And now they have uh, access to your environment. So we also need to protect that. Now, while we, we care about the service principles that we need to access Azure, mostly we want to separate the ones who do production or non-production uh, because they could get mix, mixed up. And something that should be in non-production could make its way to production, which is also something you want to uh, avoid at all times. And finally, secrets that our pipeline uses to access external external systems. It's the same principle where you don't want production or non-production to mix up, uh, or you don't want something to be written to the wrong resource group or the wrong management group or whatever, because I think everyone has their stories about seeing this going completely wrong. And uh, yeah, infrastructure as code is awesome, but it's also able to destroy stuff pretty quickly and you're not going to get it back. So That's these hard. are all elements we need to consider. And we'll walk through all these options that we have and what we can do to protect them. Nice, yeah. With, with great power comes great responsibility, right? Absolutely. So the starting point is to manage users and permissions. So we are protecting our organization here. We don't want people to have access that shouldn't have access on it. 
And with both GitHub and Azure DevOps, we can make a connection to Azure AD. So we can use the accounts that our users probably already have and make sure people can access it through that. With uh, Azure DevOps, it's pretty much um, uh, by default you can do that. It's more or less a check mark. Uh, in GitHub Actions, as you see, it's also a check mark, which you see uh, in the screenshot, but you do need to use GitHub Enterprise. This doesn't work on Teams accounts. You need Enterprise for that. And with using that, you can set permissions. So you can make sure that not everyone is able to do everything. And I've had this happen like just a few weeks ago where I said, hey, can I get access to the code of someone's uh, repository? Or this was uh, a Git, an Azure DevOps project. And I said, hey, can you give me access so I can create a pull request? And they said, here, you are now a project administrator. <laughs> And this happens, and uh, yeah, I didn't have bad intentions, so it worked out well, but it's something to be good to be disciplined in to set the straight permission, see what something and someone actually needs. And with Azure DevOps, what you can actually do is use deny permissions. And I think this is confusing for everyone who has made its way as a system administrator back in the old days when we were using Active Directory. Uh, because we were always taught you never use deny. Deny is available, but you are not allowed to touch it. And we've been brought up with that. And uh, setting deny permissions always seems like a bad thing, but it's actually very useful in Azure DevOps. I've used it for simple stuff as making sure that one board, which was kind of a private board within a project, that it was not available for everyone, but just the relevant people. So you can set the permissions like you see in the screenshot and don't be afraid to use deny permissions. They're really okay to use in Azure DevOps. One of the, one of the call outs here is just yeah, be aware of the Azure DevOps mission model because um, it doesn't behave the same as what, what you think the Azure one will be. So it's caught me out a few times. So the main one being that a deny permission will override that allow permission if you have it on the same, on the same pipeline or, or board or something. Yeah, and it can be confusing. I have set up uh, yes. <laughs> something where I was like, oh no, my board is completely empty, but that was because I had denied myself access to the board. So yeah, uh, it happens to all of us. <laughs> yeah, make a free organization and play around with it. So just check um, to save yourself some panic, just play ar around with it. And no, you can always turn it back, but just see how it all works. All right, and then we need to protect our code branches. So especially the main branch should have some protection on there. Um, the main branch should be uh, connected to an Azure environment. And I think in an ideal scenario, there's some sort of pipeline running automatically. You don't always have that. You don't always have that possibility. And you do need to have very good testing in place to have that. But if you change something in the code and that it's uh, automatically deployed, to your Azure environment. That requires though, that you take very, very good care of that main branch. And you can do that what we see here in Azure DevOps, we can have branch policies where we say there is a number of reviewers that is required, which means that you cannot push go directly. You always have to create a pull request. You can define what, what people should review the code. You can check work items. You can say some automated testing needs to be completed before a pull request can work. So you can do that kind of stuff to make sure that your brain main branch stays secure. And this is an Azure yeah. DevOps, but uh, we can also do this in GitHub Actions, which we'll see on the next slide here. Um, in GitHub Actions over GitHub, you can do this as well. Uh, you can create a name of a branch and you can say you acquire pull requests. So basically stuff like the same checks you can add here. It's really great to just check out what options you have. One cool thing you can do in GitHub is you can also do this for branches that do not exist yet. Oh, wow. So you can set up, if someone creates a branch with this name, or if some automatic process creates a name with a branch with this name, these are the branch protection rules I want to add to that. Nice. Yeah, my favorite one is running a pipeline for, for a branch rule. That, that's the one that I, I love using, and I use it all the time. Yeah, that's how you get automated tested in testing in there, right? Yeah, great. So talking about testing. 
testing and reviewing your code. And um, this is mostly about uh, making a team aware that there are possibilities and you should use them. And we're talking about the code itself. So some people have said to me that you cannot change uh, test infrastructure as code, but I think this whole series <laughs> proves them wrong. <laughs> so watch the series if you want to see some good options about testing uh, infrastructure as code and BICEP, but also consider the GEML file itself. So the GEML file itself should also be taken very seriously and every change to that should be reviewed. Because this is where people can just take tasks away or add tasks. Like we talked about, they can add a task like, yeah, let's create some logging. And then before you know it, all your connection strings are in the log and they are now breached. So it's, it's not good, good. not a good time. So, and now the pipeline agents and runners. And first thing to know is that you have the choice of two different agents or runners. You can use the one that are Microsoft hosted, which you often do as the default, where uh, everything is hosted by Microsoft. So you don't have to set up anything yourself. You just get that compute power uh, from Azure DevOps or GitHub. Uh, but you can also create your own. So you can create your own agent on a virtual machine. You install a little bit of software and then you can connect that uh, to your uh, Azure DevOps or your GitHub environment. Now, Igor, what's, which one of these have you seen the most often or which one do you prefer? Well, yeah, well, um, I prefer using a combination, to be honest, right? So, you know, I'm a fair person. So, you know, with some of my customers, we'd maybe use a Microsoft one to build. And then because a lot of the customers have networking controls, right, where they do want to have, you know, some control over the IPs that are allowed to connect to their resources, they'll use uh, self-hosted ones, right? So VMs that they manage to do deployments into a more of a controlled lockdown environment where maybe some of the public um, IPs from the Microsoft ones um, aren't allowed through, through firewalls and, and whatnot. Yeah, yeah, that's something to consider. I've seen that a lot as well. Uh, what I've often seen is that uh, self-hosted agents are also used to feel like it's a bit more controlled because you have complete control of what versions are running, uh, which is also a downside because you need to update that thing because often new versions come along because of security risks. So yes. new versions of software or modules, uh, you need to update them yourself on that agent. Um, one of the best things I think about the self-hosted agent is that you can make use of managed identity. So you can Love use that. managed identity to get a connection to Azure and you don't have to use a service principle and a managed identity. You don't have to uh, keep track of the credentials. So that's a better scenario. But then again, the downside is that if people have access to that agent, so if people are able to log into it, they might use it. So they might use those managed identities to do stuff themselves, which was like scenario four or five that we saw at the beginning, uh, which is kind of a big risk because that also means that you're, you've just lost control of that managed identity. So if someone is pushing something into your environment and you don't know who, if everyone can log in to that agent. Yeah. yeah, I think that that's definitely a key point because that's something that you might not be aware of straight away. But in, in general, I always love, you know, the less connections or the less uh, secrets and credentials to manage, the, the, the better. Yeah, so uh, yeah, they all got, both got their upsides and downsides. So it's really a decision to make. And it might be a good idea to just consider both. I've seen yeah, a, a I agree. lot. There we have the feeling like we need to choose. Maybe we can just have both of them. Yeah, why not? Best of both worlds, right? <laughs> All right. So we'll move on uh, to the next thing to consider, and that is third-party components. And we actually have those quite often when we're working with pipelines because we have community tasks. So we have tasks in the marketplace for Azure DevOps, and we have actions in GitHub Actions. Uh, these are community driven and they are pretty great because often they are created by someone who has the same problem as you have. So they're solving problems that the community has found. 
Uh, but it's good to be critical of them because they're not created by Microsoft or some company that you might already know. Uh, so they are created by a third party and you need to check out if they are trustworthy, if this is not just one individual, for example. Now, with the Azure DevOps Store, there is a lot of control on there. If you want an extension in the Azure DevOps Store, you need to like provide some proof that you are uh, keeping track of this, that you are maintaining that thing and uh, some other stuff. So it's not that easy to get your extension into the Azure DevOps Store. So they, while you have less extensions, they do take some of that sorrow away from you. Uh, in GitHub Actions, everyone can add anything at every time. And you can see that because there are, um, probably by now, there are already 17,000 actions in there. Wow, that's a lot. That's a lot, and that's amazing because they do make your life easier. This is someone who have had the same problem as you have, so you don't have to write that action. Someone else has written it for you. Uh, but every individual can write this. And maybe they create a version and say, hey, this is what you can use. And then they create a new version and there is some malicious software on there or some malicious action that you cannot view because it's happening in the back and you have only tested the previous version. So what you can do to protect yourself is uh, uh, hold on to the versions that you have. So don't even go to just, I need this major version. No have a hard-coded version in there so that you only upgrade after you can do some manual checks. And what can help in the actions is make use of the check mark. So you can see one in the screenshot here, uh, the close still issues action, which is the first one that appears uh, when you open it. Uh, it's created by GitHub. So it's trustworthy and there is a check mark there that says this is created by GitHub actions. So it has that sense of security. And you have a lot from Azure as well. That's a good so that's going to help you keep track. All right. And now we're going to protect our pipeline service principle. And I want to show this real quickly. Um, some things that you can do to protect your connection to Azure. So on my screen here, we can see uh, a GitHub repository that I can use here. So from GitHub, I want to create a connection to Azure. So I'll have an action, but I can't do that immediately. So what I usually do is create secrets. So if I go to settings right here, and then in the menu here, I go to secrets and variables, and I select the one from the actions. And here is the information that I use to connect to Azure. In this case, I've chosen to um, also have some settings on the Azure Dev the Azure sites, which I will show in a second. So I have to sequence here the client ID, subscription ID, and tenant ID. This is what I need to make the connection. Note here that I am able to update the secret and I am able to delete it. And I can create new ones, but I cannot view this secret, even though I created this one myself, but also if I have access to another repository who was made by someone else, I cannot view this secret. So that's pretty good. And if I now look at the service principle that I used in my Azure environment, so this is the service principle. And what I did here, if we go to certificates and secrets, now, one of the ways you can create that connection is by using uh, a client secret and set it up there. As you see, this one doesn't have a client secret because I've created a federated credential. So this is a direct connection between this service principle and this specific GitHub repository. So this, ser this service principle knows that it, when it gets a request, it will check if the request comes from this specific repository. If it is not from that repository, it will not do anything. So this is a great way to make sure that even if your credentials are leaked and someone tries to use them at some other repository, then on the Azure side, it will not allow it. It will say, okay, I'm not gonna do this because you're not from the right repository. This can be seem like a bit scary when you try to set it up for the first time, but it's actually very doable. And there is a module in this uh, learn series to see how this works. So I do recommend that you check that out. 
Now we can also work with Azure, with Azure DevOps. We use a service connection and I wanted to show this menu real quickly. So if you go to project settings, then the service connections, you find your Azure connections and you can open security. Uh, I can also protect my Azure connection. So the connection is set up, but what I can do here is I can set up who is allowed to use it. So I can set permissions specifically for this Azure connection. So maybe I can say some people are not allowed to change anything from it. But I can also tell which pipelines are able to use it. Now, I don't have any restrictions here, but I can add restrictions that say only specific pipelines are uh, allowed to use this specific service principle. I can also do that with projects. So I can say, in this case, only this project is allowed to use this service principle. Uh, I can share it with other projects, but at this point, if someone else creates a project, tries to use this service principle, they won't even be able to find it. So that's some extra care you can take when you're creating your service principles in Azure DevOps. So from here, let's move on uh, from our service principles, which are now secure. Uh, in GitHub, you have some extra security features that we do want to mention. So you have uh, the Pandabot, which doesn't do that much for infrastructure as code, but it is a really cool option you have. But something I want to mention here is the secret scanning, which is actually pretty impressive. So life happens and people make mistakes and maybe at some point you do add some sort of key uh, to a public repository. And um, it has happened to me, I've done it before. Uh, I've done it one with an Azure credential, which accidentally I didn't know the repository was public. Um, and I got an email within a minute that said, hey, wow. <laughs> you have just <laughs> uploaded a secret to your, uh, I think it was to a storage account. So you have added a secret to a storage account to a public GitHub repository, which is not the greatest idea. No. And I also did it recently with an API key and I also got a minute, an email within minutes. So the secret scanning is really uh, helpful. Um, one thing that's important to think about, if you do accidentally add a secret to a GitHub repository, don't bother trying to remove it. I mean, you should remove it, but it's gonna be in the Git history. Don't bother trying to get rid of it in the Git history. Consider the secret breached and you need to change it. Don't try to save face or try to save the secret. No, just change that secret, roll it over and connect to a new one. And uh, hopefully not do it again. That's a very good tip. I think <clears throat> it's part of that, you know, planning process is, you know, planning for failure and planning for emergencies, right? So I think, you know, if it, if it does happen based on your resources, do have a plan on how to rotate or refresh any of those um, secret credentials. Yeah, it's good to have some sort of plan that you can go to. So another thing you can use in Azure DevOps and GitHub Actions, you have auditing logs, which will tell you exactly what is happening in your environment. So here we see one on an organization account on uh, GitHub, where I can see, well, here some things were done by a GitHub system, which is correct. Uh, in this case, it's deleting old versions, but it's also part of our pipeline. So I can see which identity is doing what in uh, and our environment. It is good to check these once in a while. I like your picture there. Yeah, this is the repository of my user group, uh, the DDoc Dutch dog. <laughs> <laughs> so the things we've looked for, so every element we try to protect, we have something we can do for it. So we have a list here. I'm not gonna walk through every one of them for the sake of time, and we have seen them before. Um, make a screenshot now or look back at uh, this session on a later time, and maybe you can look through all of them. You can also find them in the Learn module, but realize what options you have to secure all elements of your repository and pipeline. Yeah, some really, really good ways to do it. I can see here. So definitely go back and 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 take a look, and also look at the the learn module for for more detail. Yeah. 
Cool. So we talked about securing your pipelines and repositories, but what about your environment, right? So now we're going to look at securing your Azure environment, right? So in this unit, we'll learn how to structure users and permissions, right, to uh, secure your environment. We also, you know, as, as we talked about planning, right? So you want to plan for emergency. So we'll look at, you know, what does that actually mean? Uh, and also how we can go back and audit those changes as well of what's happened in that emergency, right? So the first thing that we can do is stopping humans, right? So <laughs> humans wreck everything, don't we, right? No, I'm just kidding. But if we don't block human access, someone could inadvertently, right, not maliciously, we saw kind of in my example previously, circumvent those controls that you've worked so hard to put in, right? So. We want to make sure that all the time we've invested in, in planning and implementing all of our good kind of process for deploying infrastructure, deploying configuration, <clears throat> we want to make sure that we enforce that, right? And one way we can do that is by securing our environment and blocking those human controls, right? So we can do that um, quite easily. And one of the ways we can do that is using, you would have guessed it, RBAC or role-based access control, right? So to block human access, we'd use role-based access control. And what we'd do is we'd create what's called a role assignment, right? And as we mentioned earlier, you can actually do this through, through BICEP, right? So you can create role assignments for groups, uh, users, and even security uh, service principles through, through BICEP, right? So when we talk about role-based access control, we talk about the scope, right? For So the scope is which users uh, are we talking about, right? So we can have a look there and you can apply it to groups. You can apply it to individual users that we can see in our screenshot here. So the first thing we want to decide is the scope, right? So typically this might be some sort of uh, function or, or a team as part of your project. You know, it's common to have developers, cloud admins in a group, but maybe, uh, you know, individual users. But as a general rule of thumb, you do want to try use cloud only groups for your role based access control uh, in, in your Azure environment, right? So once we decided the scope, we need to decide on the role, right? So the role of the group or the person or set of people that we want to apply. So in the next kind of screenshot there, you can see at the bottom, you know, we do have some traditional roles that you're probably familiar with if you've used the portal before. So the owner, contributor, reader, uh, those are what's called a built-in role, right? And what we can take a look at later on is there's a whole bunch of built-in roles nowadays, right? So there's ones for VM contributors and backup contributors. So you can really apply that, that kind of least privileged uh, concept, right? And if you need to, um, you can also kind of create your own. But the whole idea is, is that you want to apply least, least privilege to a particular scope um, and, you know, ideally not have human access uh, you know, being able to use the service principles that we've talked about securing in, in the previous module or the previous unit that, that Barbara's taken us through. So in Azure, we do have two types of access, right? So we do have uh, two types of operations, I should actually say. So we have control plane, right? So with a control plane, that's what's used to provision our resources, right? So when we want to provision our storage account, when we want to provision our key vault, we use what's called a control plane operation. This is what talks to the ARM or Azure Resource Manager, right? So an example being a storage account, right? So, you know, if you're using Azure, uh, probably you would have used a storage account before, right? So storage accounts have, have multiple different purposes, which is, you know, we're not going to kind of get into it today. But with a storage account, when you create it, that's what's called a control plane operation. On the other hand, we have data plane operations, right? So control and data. So taking our example of our storage account, a data plane operation is what we use to access, you would have guessed it, the data inside it, right? So as we can kind of see here, we've created our storage account and then we've created our images blob container, which we can put all our nice images from our vacation the year previously or any sort of content that we need to, to uh, put in there. When we're looking at governance, you can also enforce you know, data plane access um, by by only using a key, for example. So by not using a key. So what you can do is, you know, through, through Azure policy or through certain uh, actions, what you can do is only allow an Azure AD resource, right, such as a security print or service principle to access uh, your, your, your data plane, right? So more and more resources are allowing this uh, as well. 
So emergency access and planning for that, right? So as, as we kind of, you know, a lot of the concepts in the cloud is, you know, planning for failure, you know, planning for emergency, right? So you, you do want to plan, uh, plan ahead for any of these uh, situations, right? So sometimes, you know, emergencies might happen, right? So someone could accidentally uh, configure something in the production environment where they thought there was dev. There could be maybe a, a outage or someone is away that you've put in as a deployment approver. You do want to have a emergency access flow to be able to access your production environment, right? And quickly investigate or resolve any problems, right? So it is important to implement this plan, but also one of the key things is to actually rehearse it, right? So there's a famous saying, you know, your your backups are only good as your last test, or your disaster recovery plan is only good as its last test. So, you know, with everything, with your with your BICEP templates, with your emergency access flow please test it out, right? So, you know, sometimes you might have an emergency access flow that was, you know, created by someone three or four years ago that, that's left the organization and maybe you can't read their handwriting. Um, you do want to be able to, to test this going forward, right? So with emergency access, one of the approaches for us to consider is being able to use what's called a break glass account, right? So what a break glass account is, it's a special user, right? And this user, uh, it's exempt or it, it, you usually have two, right? So you have two or more break glass accounts. And the whole idea is, is that if you're using multi-factor authentication, you want to make sure that it's got different methods, right? So maybe one break glass account might use authenticator app and the other might use one of those FIDO tokens, right? So the whole idea is, is that you're building resiliency in case there might be, you know, some sort of MFA or network outage, which will prevent you from from accessing that account, right? But if you wanted yeah. more details on how to create an account, um, we do we do have good guidance there. But Barbara, do you have any examples of having to use a break glass account or planning to yeah. use a, a break glass account there? This uh, brings us back to a long, <laughs> long time ago. I think it was like five years ago, but we had uh, some five years ago, there was a pretty big incident where worldwide there was a problem with uh, multi-factor authentication in oh, Azure. No. Uh, it was huge, actually. It took like eight hours. I think it happened twice in a month. And the problem was that everyone had multi-factor authentication because we were told to do that. Mm -hmm. And people couldn't get into the Azure admin center to turn it off so their users could work. Oh. And it was a crazy event. And I remember at our company, we were lucky because we had a bypass on the multi-factor authentication from an Intune managed device. So nice. from Intune managed devices, we could all access the portal. And I don't think we even turned off multi-factor authentication. We just told people, yeah, work on your work laptop, <laughs> uh, which we could do at that point. But I remember after that, uh, there was really a push for break glass accounts. And it was something we didn't realize we might need some time. But uh, it was also for our company the time that we started to invest at the time, which is all, it always works like that. So you know how important this once it goes wrong. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. But yeah, pretty recently, I think like uh, somewhere last month, we had a sort of incident like that, mostly across Europe where uh, there were also problems with multi-factor authentication. They weren't as extensive, but uh, it was like four hours where things just weren't working. And there also Teams wasn't working and Azure DevOps pipelines weren't working. So it was pretty big. Yeah, stuff like that happens. And if you have a break glass account where you can say, hey, something is wrong with multi-factor authentication, but we have another kind here that we can use, they can make sure that you can access your environment, because that's the goal. You don't want to lose access to your environment. That's right. That's right. So, and, and with a break glass, um, one of the key points I mentioned is sometimes you don't realize you need it until until it's maybe too late, right? So it is good to to plan for that. Um, and I'm I'm sure if you're wondering the term break glass, it's you know it's meant to be used in those emergency scenarios, right? Just like you might you know break that fire panel uh, or the fire alarm panel yeah. when you want to get the extinguisher. <laughs> yeah. Now that, that's, that, that, that's good stuff. So um, we have another flow for emergency access. So we, we can have the um, other account, the break glass account, but we do have another way to do emergency access. And what that is, is using a Azure AD feature called Privileged Identity Management or PIM. Okay. Yeah. So what this does, uh, we can actually demo it in the portal super quickly. 
So if I just flick over to my uh, account here, I'm logged in under my normal account, right? And then you can do privilege identity management for a few different things, right? So you can use it for Azure AD roles. These are more your familiar roles like security admin, uh, you know, global admin if, if you really need to. But you can also do it to Azure resources, right? So pretend, you know, if I'm facing a failure in my normal account, right, doesn't, or my normal privilege doesn't give me access to maybe, you know, view some resources or, you know, check check some of the config or, or go into the Kudu portal to see what, what's been deployed. What I can do is click on activate role. And based on the group that I'm, at, and I'm in, it will give me the ability to see what I have is what's called an eligible assignment, right? So I can see here I'm eligible based on my group membership against my resource, which is at non-prod, which is a subscription. And what this will do for a temporary amount of time, it will give me the contributor role, right? So all I need to do, you know, this obviously needs to be set up earlier, which I've done. I can go to activate. This is all you're able to customize. So some organizations might have an approval process. You know, some might have an MFA. But for this instance here, I just need to put a reason. You can also put in some sort of request number. So I can say, you know, emergency based on service request one, two, three. And all I need to do is activate, right? And when I click activate, this will start that uh, privileged identity workflow. And it, it's really good. So based on my time that I've configured or the time that as an administrator, I've allowed my users to elevate themselves, all I need to do is go into here, follow the steps that are configured. And then um, you know, once this completes, it will give me the access for a certain amount of time, right? So this kind of goes back to the whole just in time, just enough access. This is already such a strong feature just to have awareness of, hey, yes. you are now using a privilege. I mean, in most companies I work with, every admin access except break glass is through PIM. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it gives some awareness. And I've experienced it myself where I needed to uh, activate it for an uh, application administrator to do something with an SPN. And it really brought me to the point, okay, do I actually need to do this? And yeah. if I did, then I can just activate it without issues. And um, if not, then it's like it's some sort of awareness, like I'm doing a privileged action now. Yeah, so I should exactly. Be careful. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of the time, um, there are reports out there, but you know, people with administrative access, you only use it for a subset of time, right? Which you know, if it is constantly active, it is a security risk, right? So the whole you know, just in time and, and, and just enough access. So as we've seen here, our, uh, our our request has has gone through. So if I click on active assignments, I will be able to see it here once it loads up, which is just taking a little while. But what I can do now is if it's gone through, I can go into my app non-prod subscription and I can do contributor tasks, right? So I can see here, my role is actually a contributor role. Right, so that's gone through that process. Um, so this is this is really good as part of that emergency, or you know, if you do need to circumvent your normal controls, um, obviously, you know, you don't want to be using this all the time. Um, one of the benefits as well is that it's all audited, right? So I've got my audit history here, so I can kind of see here's my my user Tony Pepperoni, the best the best pizza flavor, and I can see here, you know, I've added myself. And I've also ele elevated myself over these are the different time spans over the past week. So this is my view. Obviously, if I'm an administrator, I want to audit uh, everything that's happened from a from a PIM perspective. That's also a, a good ability there as well, right? So it just captures you know all that auditing capability and allows me to kind of see what's what's going on, right? And this and this is complementary to some of the other auditing features that that we have, right? So for example, I can see here under my subscription or resource group, there's the good old activity log, right? So this gives me insights. Okay, the the break glass uh, or my PIM workflow has happened, I've elevated, but what have I actually done, right? So I can see here in my activity log, um, I haven't done anything now, but remember previously in our conversation that we've had, I've tried to delete that storage account and that's captured under the activity log here, right? So I can see what's happened here. But then also as part of my Azure AD tenant, I do have different uh, components here, such as sign-in logs uh, over here and, and audit logs. So the account that I'm logged in under now doesn't have access to them, but if I wanted to, 
I could, um, you know, if I did have access, I can kind of click into here and see, you know, what's signed in to my uh, Azure tenant and also from an auditing perspective as well, right? So being able to kind of combine all those three will give you a clear picture as to, you know, what's maybe happened in that emergency, um, but also what's happened in general in, in our Azure environment, right? So auditing those changes, right? So what we can do uh, even through uh, through Bicep is be able to set up the logging, right? So right now we obviously just kind of checked it through the through the portal, but what you can do and what a lot of organizations do is shipping that somewhere such as Log Analytics, right? Shipping all those sources in, and that way you can analyze them using KQL to build a pretty graph or just to see you know what's actually happened during the amount of time. And we do have guidance and different learn modules available for you to figure out how to use the um, analyzing language there. Awesome. Cool. So I hope you've been listening. Uh, what we're going to move on to now is a knowledge check. So yeah. Barbara, if you want to take question one for us, take a take Yeah, a so you can follow along now. This is your time as if you were to uh, uh, also see if you have listened and if you understand the material. So you can vote with the link aka.ms slash polls. There will be three questions there so keep track of it or you can scan the QR code. And for the first question, you are concerned that applying controls to your production Azure environment might cause problems with automated deployments. In particular, you're concerned that you won't discover problems until your changes are deployed to production when it's too late to fix them. What can you do to mitigate this risk? A, apply, apply the same controls to some of your non-production environments. B, disable the controls on your production environment. Or C, apply branch protection rules to your remain to your repository's main branch. So let's give everyone some time to fill in that poll. I'm hoping that it's live yet. So we're not going to give away any answers at no, this point. Yet. So this is really about the first part we talked about, the different environments that you have, how you can work with them. And maybe we could uh, consider, is there one answer, Igor, that you think is clearly not the right answer? Is so there something we can eliminate? <laughs> yeah, well, if I was uh, to say, I think it's, based on what we've learned over the series, um, controls and production environment does go together quite well, right? So I think disabling the controls of our production environment uh, isn't the best idea. But that's just my opinion. So we might have to, might have to see. Always that kind of answer in there. And I really love that one where it's like, um, this is like the same answer as uh, ignore the error. <laughs> mm -hmm. I always like mm -hmm. these answers. Like we've been talking about controlling your environments for <laughs> uh, pretty much an hour now, but let's say, yeah, disable those controls. That should be a good solution. Yeah, just, so yeah. the good thing is that no one thought this was the right answer so far. That's so good. I think we've got our vote in. Igor, do you want to suggest what the right answer might be? Well, the right answer is A. Hey, Right, so we talked about you know having those different controlled environments, especially in one of those the slides, and we had a nice table there. So you know an easy way to do that is you know why not just apply the same controls, right? So applying those same controls um, will really help you in you know discovering those problems early. Or you might have heard of one of those concepts shift, shift left, right? This is this is how you can actually um, well it will help you uh, achieve that. Yeah, and over seventy percent got the correct answer on that yeah, so, yeah. awesome good people stuff. really following along good stuff team cool i think so we've got another one there on. yeah yeah let's have a look so here's question number two so you decide to enforce a deployment of your infrastructure as code right you want to prohibit manual changes to your resources which of the following tools should you implement all right so we have talked about all three of these today uh, and hopefully one of these should stick out um, in terms of how to stop stop that human access. I'll give you some time. Yes, yeah, so we don't want manual changes. 
to our resources. So we need to consider yeah, exactly. how we can do that. We want it to go through the amazing uh, deployment process that we've discussed during during the series. So we'll give a little bit of time, but I think we've got most voters in there. Uh, maybe we start off again with the wrong answers where um, we gave a lot of love to resource tax, but they <laughs> are done. not the way to work here. Um, maybe you can set something up with automation, but you're getting yourself in a whole lot of trouble. I wouldn't do it. So resource tags are not the answer to go for here. Um, and yeah, Azure Monitor kind of gives it a way mm -hmm. that it monitors. It doesn't prohibit. Exactly. It can so monitor. What does that leave us with? It can alert. It cannot prohibit. And I don't have to make this too exciting because 100% of the voters know, knew the right answer. Uh, yeah. And it's air bug control. And it does sound like uh, prohibiting manual changes. I think a lot of people uh, in first instance think about disabling access to the portal, which you can do, by the way. Um, but that's kind of extreme. This can also really work with making sure that only the right people can do stuff manually, or maybe only if they uh, have used something like privilege identity management. Nice. So speaking of that, uh, which Lip, of the Lip. following statements yeah describes the benefit of using privileged identity management so if you want to run the team through some of the answers there barbara yeah so the options we have which statement describes the benefit of using privileged identity management we have pim prevents all unauthorized changes to our azure environment or B, PIM enables users to use a separate account to access our, your Azure environment with higher permissions than they usually have. Or C, PIM enables users to request that their accounts are temporarily granted higher permissions than they usually have. So the votes are already slowly coming in. Nice. And yet, yeah, privilege identity management was one of the last things we talked about, and we actually saw in the portal how it yeah. works. So everyone should know this answer, right? <laughs> <laughs> so could we maybe already say like one answer that is not correct? Yeah, well, I think the answer A, right? So PIM prevents all unauthorized changes to your Azure environment. So for this one, um, well, it's kind of similar to the question two that we had, right? So to stop any unauthorized changes, um, we wouldn't necessarily use PIM, or even though it could complement it, we'd use um, RBAC, right? Or role-based access control, as we saw the big uh, kind of, you know, stop stop human access. So, you know, to do that, I guess, you know, unauthorized is the same. So uh, in my opinion, um, I, I think it's definitely not A. All right, well, um... We actually, this is the first one where we got votes on all the options. Oh. <laughs> um, but we've got over 70% on the correct answer here. So could you tell a little bit about it? You yeah. why this is correct? Yeah. So the answer C, as we kind of mentioned, so PIM enables users to request that their accounts are temporarily granted higher permissions than they usually have, right? So with PIM or Privilege Identity Management, as you kind of see here, you know, the administrator or the owner of the subscription or, you know, uh, whatever function you have at, have at your business or of your customers, they can configure a PIM workflow, right? So that way, you know, it can go through an approval, as I mentioned, they can just put a justification in if it's something maybe lower risk. Um, but then what, what they'll do is we step through that kind of one, two, three processes for a temporary amount of time which is configurable, they'll be granted that elevated permission, right? And that's obviously higher than what, than what they usually have. Yeah, and the second option, we can have a whole new discussion about that one. Uh, yes. <laughs> so yes. Uh, for the sake of time, no, let's not uh, get into that, but it's a nice one to discuss about. Nice. All right, so we're at uh, closing time pretty much. So, um, to summarize what we talked about, we can, had talked about how you can plan an Azure deployment strategy for multiple environments. So we're not just talking production. You need de development, maybe demos, maybe sandboxes. So you can consider that. 
Uh, we've talked about how you can harden and help secure Azure DevOps, GitHub, and the deployment pipeline, all the different elements that come uh, with your code and where you can store your code and how you can work with that. And we talked about how you can harden and help secure an Azure environment and ensure that changes are made through a control process like Airbag, um, like we used PIM and all the other abbreviations we have available. And we've talked about our break glass account, which I still think is one of the best named features there is. <laughs> so you yes. can have, if you have an emergency in case of fire, you can break the glass and you can give yourself access to your environment. Nice. So we do have more resources here as well. So if you want to go to the aka.ms link, or if you prefer to scan your QR code, please do so for um, the ability to access more resources about some of the content that we've that we've talked about. Yeah, and check out those learn modules that are available. Here you see the direct link to learn live. You can also use the key QR code. I do recommend to do this every module in the learning path. If you think like this is a little bit high over, um, then still think about doing the whole module and starting at the beginning of the learning path. What Microsoft Learn does is first you get some theory and then you get some practice. So you actually get to do the stuff you learn about as you go, which for me really is a great way to learn stuff. I don't exactly. learn by just reading about it. I want to do stuff as well. Yeah, so you can you can do read and watch. So a combination of all three, right? Yeah, really, it's an awesome resource, and you can follow this complete module right there. Awesome. And if you'd re like to re, so obviously this is the last episode of our series. Yeah. Uh, if you'd like to rewatch uh, the whole series or any particular episodes, uh, that is available to you as well at the aka.ms link, or you have the ability to to scan the QR code as well. Yeah, you can use the, the really long short link that we have over here. <laughs> you can also watch the whole series. You can watch the previous series as well. Uh, so a lot of people has been have been involved and done these sessions. So it's been a great experience. And I hope that it's also something where, uh, yeah, you can get something from as a learner and learn about BICEP. Yeah, exactly. So I think that's pretty much all we have. So I think what we have now is to thank the moderators who have been working here. We want to thank Ryan, our producer, who's also been helping out uh, behind the scenes. And yeah, Igor, thank you for being here. It's been great to prepare everything yeah, thanks, right Barbara. here from across the world. <laughs> yes, representing, I think, three different time zones between the teams. So yeah, thanks for having, uh, thanks for joining us wherever in the world you're located or wherever the time might be. So. Maybe a good morning or a, or a good night. All right. Bye. See ya. Yeah.